Hello and welcome to the From Way Downtown Pacers podcast. I'm Pacers editor Nat Newell for Indy Star. Here, of course, with Dustin Dopirak, our Pacers insider. Uh, Dustin uh, has a piece today on IndyStar.com about the Pacers playoff chances and looking at the competition and where uh, all that lies. We'll also talk a little bit about Tyrese Halliburton and all NBA. But uh, Dustin, sort of take us through. Uh, what you learned uh, looking at all the teams in the East. Uh, Pacers, according to basketballreference.com right now, have a 72, 73% chance of of being a top six seed, which is the most important uh, number for them right now. But uh, what did you learn? What did you see from looking through all the schedules um, uh, and the other teams in the East? Yeah, I mean, there's just still a little, a lot of moving parts here. Uh, you know, obviously, I think you're looking at um, they're they're not mathematically eliminated from second. I mean, they're not going to be second. I mean, there's no way that no way on this earth that they make up a five game uh, deficit. You know, from the Bucks, uh, I bet at this point, and jump everybody in between. But they're not eliminated uh, from that spot, and so they're only two and a half back of Cleveland. I think they're two back of the Knicks. Um, I think they're what a game and a half back of Orlando. I want to say I'm going to double check that. Um, but it's, I mean, it, it's close. You know, it's it's extremely close. And also, I, mean, I think you look at look at schedules and everything like that. And, and you know, it's hard to say. Okay, does, does somebody have you know even from from three to eight? Does anybody have a real advantage here? Um, and I don't think there is. I think it's just a question of like if if you've got the ability, to uh, you're going to be all right. I mean, I think it's it's I think it's going to be harder to hard to make up. Um, you know, I think it's gonna be hard to make up space. I think basically there's a good chance you can end up being where you are, but that puts the Pacers in a position where, you know, that, that Sunday game against the heat, that 5 PM game is going to be a big one. Uh, basically I think that probably determines where they end up. I mean, obviously I think they've got, um, should be in good shape. You know, you, you would think they've been able to just blow through the nets twice. You would think that we would do it again in Brooklyn, unless Brooklyn turns out looking totally different than we've seen them. Um, but, you know, Oklahoma City is a tough one on Friday night. The Thunder still have a lot to play for. Obviously, they're still in that dogfight with the Timberwolves and Nuggets, uh, you know, for the number one seed. So you're not looking at a situation where, oh, you're playing a team that might be a one. Maybe they'll, you know, ease up a week before the season ends. They will not. You're going to see the full, you know, full weight and force of Shea Gilgis, Alexander, and Jalen Williams, and Chet Holmgren, and those guys. Um, and then you follow that up with the Heat. And so, you know, I think uh, I was asked on the radio today, like, who would you rather be the Pacers or the Heat coming into this with the schedules that the Heat have and the Pacers have? I mean, the one the thing that you have if you're the Heat is you have Jimmy Butler, uh, you know, and you have Bam Adebayo, and you have the experience of, you know, uh, of having gone in the finals in 2020 and having gone back last year as an eight seed uh they just have something that they can summon and obviously the Pacers are in, in a rough spot of of not having that kind of experience um but they've also proven time and time again that they don't hit you know they don't hit major skits uh you know I, I'm presuming they're going to lose some games out of this last six they're not going to go undefeated um but one game you know might become two but it doesn't become three or four and it never becomes five um so you know you don't expect them for the bottom to fall out um down the stretch but I mean I think you know you get you look ahead I and mean, I think you know um it, it, I don't know it, it's easy to catch Orlando just because Orlando is, is steady uh as much as they are young um they're a team that's excellent defensively and they tend not to lose to teams that they're not supposed to lose to I mean they've got some challenging games uh left on the board I'm gonna have to call them up to look at exactly what it is um in terms of who they're playing but I, I think you know it, it's it's no less manageable than anybody else I think they've got a couple games that you look at and say okay well you can pencil one in uh at that point so I mean they've got they're at New Orleans but they've got Charlotte um they've got Chicago uh they got Houston they got a couple against Milwaukee and they might benefit from maybe Milwaukee sitting there guys uh if they're able to clinch that two seed you know by the you know they play the April 10th, April 14th, they might have an advantage there. And the Magic have come in. They've won seven of their last 10. Um, so I think the Magic are going to be difficult to catch. Uh, the Knicks obviously are, have every reason to push Cleveland for three, and they might be able to catch them. Uh, you know, they've obviously got some losable games on there. You know, they're playing Miami. They've got a couple against Chicago, which still has a lot to play for. Boston and Sacramento is obviously a playoff team. Um, and, you know, that's their schedule's just okay. You know, Cleveland has been stumbling a little bit, you know, obviously as they've just get all, gotten all their guys back and nobody's necessarily 100%. They're, they're in the middle of a West Coast road trip, so that might give them – maybe they stumble and come back to the pack a little bit, and it's actually Cleveland they end up chasing uh, for fifth or sixth. But it's, you know, uh, there, there are a couple, bunch of different ways they can go in terms of moving up. Um, and, you know, again, they can easily, you know, move down, and they're certainly going to have a fight with a Heat team um, that, again, has, you know, postseason experience. You know, they've got – uh, uh, some difficulty in their schedule, but they get to close out with Toronto, which will clearly be checked out by April 12th and 14th. Um, you know, so, you know, if, if, if the Heat win that game, they're, they're really in the driver.
driver's seat there. Uh, and you don't know what's going to happen with the 76ers because, I mean, Joel Embiid is apparently going to try to make a comeback. Um, apparently didn't, he wasn't a shoot-around today from what the reporting I saw for the game against the Thunder tonight, but I mean, he could easily play uh, on Thursday. And, you know, he might just be able to get them charged up for one one last push. Um, and I think I feel like you don't want to play. You, you don't want to be the team playing Philadelphia in the play-in. Uh, that's obviously uh, one of our cats, uh, Starburst tail flicking in front of the <laughs> camera there. Uh, there's another cat that's walking crazy. around in this room somewhere in our first podcast on StreamYard where you can see us. Um, sorry about that. Uh, my mother's, I was at my mother's house and my mother's cat button had her tail flipping across. So maybe this is just going to be. <laughs> that's what that's what they do. No, that's what they do. Regular podcast that they'll. There will be cat yeah. tails in the in the camera. So yeah, I'm um, at the office. Otherwise, Maxine and Jordy would be all over this for sure. <laughs> uh, one thing I found interesting looking at the odds: uh, the Pacers have a 2.5 percent chance of winning the conference, according to Basketball Reference. Uh, the the Orlando Magic are only at two percent. Obviously, at those numbers, it's not super meaningful. But it's interesting that the Pacers have a better chance uh, than Orlando. Um, and you mentioned uh, the Heat game will decide uh, the tiebreaker um, for the two teams. Uh, another thing worth noting is that the Heat and the Pacers um, are tied in the loss column right now. They both have 33 losses, um, and that, of course, is important because you can not make up losses. You can make, you know, if both teams win sure. out and they're going to end up with the same record, you, you know, you can make up wins, you can't make up losses. So, right. um, and with Cleveland's the three seed now, I think that's kind of the team. I mean, other than the Pacers, of course, owning the Milwaukee Bucks at least partially. Um, I mean, is Cleveland the team you think you want to see in this in the first round? Just because they seem to be struggling reintegrating everybody um, after that incredible run they had not too long ago. Yeah, I mean, that's your first thought is that that you wouldn't mind uh, facing those guys because they seem to be stumbling. You know, they've only won four of their last 10. Um, it, you know, now you would think if they continue to stumble, they'll, they might stumble out of the three. You know, right. that's the issue, too, is they might stumble out of the three and the four, maybe even the five. Um, and they might be in the team that you have to hold on to for six. I mean, it's 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 that close that if somebody really, you know, over the last two weeks just really stumbles hard, um, you know, you might be able to catch them. And so, I mean, they've. You know, Cleveland's such a clash of styles for them. Um, and so they've done pretty well uh, so far. I mean, they, they were able to outscore them really the first two games uh, in, you know, early in the season. You were able to beat Mitchell uh, in one of the first uh, in-season tournament games, which was one of the more impressive, I think, you know, outings of the year. Um, but, you know, got held to 103 last time. I mean, Cleveland can really, really defend. And certainly, you know, the Pacers don't have as much, uh, you know, um, overall offensive, you know, juice as they had, uh, basically when they had Buddy Heald and, and guys that were, you know, Bruce Brown and everybody who was shooting the ball, but certainly they have a, a better go-to guy in Pascal Siakam, but I think they've lost an overall amount um, of ability to score the basketball, Benedict Mather, and obviously another one we have to, have to mention, somebody could really score. Um, so when they've beaten Cleveland, they've been able to just outrun them, and like Cleveland just hasn't been able to slow them down. Um, but I think Cleveland has a better shot, chance of doing so. But on the flip side, the Pacers are better at defending. If, if they catch a Donovan Mitchell who's not um, at the height of his powers, you know they might have a chance. And especially if, if, if they can get Halliburton making some shots, um, they they are with Siakam. They are much closer to being being able to match uh, the size that Cleveland can put out there when they have Allen and Mobley both available. Obviously, Mobley's missed a lot of games this year. I think he's only at like 43 out of 75, something somewhere in that range. But I think you know he's you know rounding back in. Um, but with Siakam, I think you got a better chance of their size. Um, it's it's going to be an intriguing matchup if that's what happens. Um, I don't know if, if you'd rather play them or the Knicks. Um, you know, and again, like you said, they rode Milwaukee. You, you're, you're not um, totally opposed to the idea of pulling that off. Although I think you know, Milwaukee is a different team since they, you know, uh, went to Doc Rivers, um, and they are a stronger opponent. And certainly, they're going to be angry at the Pacers if they weren't have to have to play that series. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know if clearly, you know, they're. Right now, they're two and one uh, against Cleveland and two and one against the Knicks. So they've proven they can beat both teams. Um, you know, they, they they they've also proven they can lose to both teams. So I don't know which one is better over a seven game series. They're they're certainly both more. Um, each of them have more experience. Each of them have has you know uh, had had some playoff work. I don't think Cleveland's won. They, I mean, like Cleveland got beat, I think, by the Knicks in the first round last year. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's. I think right now, if you had to start the series right now, you'd probably want to play Cleveland, but they do have two more weeks to get right before you play them. And, and that might be a problem because then you're seeing, you know, Mitchell and Mobley and Garland. And, you know, that's not an easy team to play. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, Cleveland, 
I think should be better now because they got all their guys back, but they haven't been playing well. The Knicks are kind of the flip side of that. Randall's out. Ananobi's out again. I think Mitchell yeah. Robinson went out again after he came back. And yet they're, they keep winning. So, yeah. uh, you know. Jalen Brunson's been, been incredible. Yeah, exactly. I, I'm kind of rooting for the Knicks just so we can get a Josh Hart who says he hates Indiana, um, never wants to be here. We get a Josh Hart story. I'm sure you're looking forward to asking him about that. Exactly. You got to be here for three whole days, like three whole games, Josh Hart, or, or, yeah. or at least two, at least two games, Josh. How do you feel about this? And that'll be fun and see how the fans react to him. Um, we should give Josh Hart like indie Rex to be like, <laughs> hey, like maybe you'll hate it less if, you know, places that you might want to go to hate Indianapolis less. Um, uh, Orlando, the team, maybe you want to see least if you're the Pacers, although they did do a nice job against them in the last time they played them. Sure. No, I, I mean, they are definitely better equipped than they were at the beginning of the year. Um, you know, especially before adding Siakam, dealing with length, length was a problem. Um, dealing with real size was a problem, and they didn't really have an answer for guarding the, the you know, Paolo Bancaros of the world. You know, those, those guys were really busting them up. Um, and now even if you do put Neesmith on those guys to start, you just have more backup. You know, you, you just have more capacity to deal with those guys, and they did much better. I mean, e even last year, you know, like they won those games, but, I mean, the Magic were trouble because when you look at, you know, both the Wagners, uh, you know, Wendell Carter on top of Paolo Bancaro, and then you have – they've got size in the backcourt. You know, I mean, they've got big dudes in there. Mark Fultz isn't small. Jalen Suggs, you know, isn't small. Uh, you know, they they can go really big. You know, Gary Harris is not a small guy. You know, like they they really have a lot of big dudes. And so, you know, I mean, that that makes them a tough out um, because they are. You know, they've been so steady defensively, and they can you know they can beat you with length. They're not going to outshoot you or outscore you, but. They can beat you with size. They can beat you with rebound. They can get you, you know, beat you by getting the ball in the paint. So they are a tough matchup. Uh, again, they will be at least in a similar position in terms of youth uh, coming in there after having been a lottery team last year. You know, really relying on some super young guys. Obviously, again, their their best player is a second year player. Um, so you know, I think uh, you know they'll be in the same boat if they end up in a playoff series together. Uh, and, and it is a tough matchup, but you know, th there are I think some advantages. Pacers have, and I think they're better equipped uh, to deal with them uh, than they were, you know, some time ago. And I think Siakam obviously becomes extremely important in, in that in, in that situation. Uh, he was pretty, you know, important in that game the, the first the last time they met. And I think we can safely say that fans can set their TVs to NBA TV for a bulk of any uh, Pacers. Cavs or Pacers yes. Magic uh, first round playoff series. Right. Yeah. They're going to be uh, absolutely buried when it comes to uh, television options. That's very much the NBA TV series. No question about it. Uh, but, you know, I mean, I think, uh, you know, like, obviously, I, I do think there are people that are seeing certainly just with the style and the pace of the Pacers play um, that they're going to get a little bit more. Uh, attention certainly next year. I, I don't think they're going to have back to back years where they only get one, uh, you know, nationally televised game, you know, in the preseason, you know, in the, in the released schedule. Um, but yeah, no, if, if they're either Orlando or Cleveland, you know, with New York and Boston, Milwaukee, you know, being in the other series, then there's no chance that the paces will be absolutely buried. Uh, again, looking at the basketball reference uh, playoff odds, the, the Pacers are at 23% to finish seventh. 4.3% uh, to finish eighth. As you noted early in your story today, they cannot finish lower than eighth at this point. Um, and again, for the folks, play-in series, 17, seven holds, hosts the eight seed in the first game. Uh, the winner of that is the seven seed. The, if the ace, whoever loses that game plays the winner of the nine, 10 game. And that, and the winner of that game is the eight seed. Obviously there's, a huge edge, I think, for everyone to be – you'd much rather be seventh and eighth and play the Bucks than the, the Celtics if it comes down to that. Sure, the, sure. Pacers have probably done as well against the Celtics as anyone. I can't see them winning a seven-game series against the Celtics. No, um, no. I just wanted to touch base real quick on if they're not six, that's how things break down for them. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I, you don't, I, I feel like you just, you just really don't want to deal with Boston. I mean, like – they are not a horrible matchup for them. They have some answers for what Boston does, but like, there's also the, the the view of you know when a team just looks like it's it wants to beat the crap out of everybody, um, it has the capacity to do it. You know, that's not a team you want to mess with. I mean, Boston is charged up. You know, Boston's coming into this one to blow everybody's doors off. You know, I mean, they've they've got an eleven and a half game lead. 
you know, like, I mean, they, they just, they, they really put the pedal down um, this year. And obviously they're going to want to come into these playoffs and prove that they're not just, you know, a regular season team either. Um, so that is going to be a very, very motivated team. You're not going to be one of the, the, you know, the first team through the door uh, to have to deal with them. And that certainly doesn't mean they're going to be able to knock off Denver if they get there, you know, Milwaukee, you know, if they play, we'll certainly give them a series if they get to the Eastern conference finals, you know, some other teams can definitely, you know, cause them problems and, and even Indiana can, but you know, I just, I really don't think you want to be the, the first team playing them as an eight seed because I think they 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 really are going to be motivated to prove a lot in, in these playoffs. Uh, you've touched on where the Pacers at are at right now. I think I mean they're certainly playing better than they have been. I should also note, in the interest of full disclosure, that Buddy Heald, both you and I have been. Uh, why did you trade in the very much on the why? Why did you trade Buddy Heald team? His stats are basically the same with Philadelphia as they were with the, the Pacers. I stand by my position. I'd much rather have right. Buddy Heald on my team than not have Buddy Heald on my team. Uh, but I did right. want to note that, uh, you know, that, that he's not. He has come back to earth. Yeah. He was going crazy yeah. and, and he's slowed down since then. Right. Um, no, that's, I mean, again, yeah, to your point, still think they'd be better off if they have them. Understand the argument against. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think they're, you know, the, the, the big thing that they're missing that they had before that they don't now is, you know, just a spot up movement shooter. And, and it seems know, like there, 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 there has been a little bit of a, if they don't hit threes, they don't win vibe around them. Um, and be, sure. and he'll is, would obviously hit more threes. He's not a great defensive player. So maybe it's not the same if he's here. Um, but sure. what's, I mean, they're a better defensive team now. What's, what's different with this team? Um, in the last couple of weeks uh, than before. Yeah, no, I mean, a, a couple of things. I mean, to, obviously to that end, you know, with, with Heald gone, I mean, like the, the difference is, is that you're playing Ben Shepard more and Ben Shepard off, off the bench is a really good defender. You know, just as a rookie, he's done just tremendous work. And so, you know, he's he has been more effective. As much as you lose in shooting, you do gain a certain amount off the bench defensively with Ben Shepard, so you have less slippage. But I do think, you know, um, Siakam, I think, has really stepped his game up and Siakam doesn't have to guard – one of the two best players. Um, but he just, he has to be physical. He has to show length. And, you know, like if you get past the knee Smith or a Nemhard, you've got to run him to see a whole bunch of arms and legs and be like, Oh my God, what am I going to do here? And I think he's done a pretty good job of that, you know, of just being able, uh, you know, on switches to be able to show length, keep guards in front of him. Um, you know, even if he isn't getting a top assignment, just to still matter, rebound really well. I, I think all those things have made a difference this year. I kind of really found his role uh, defensively. I, I think Neesmith and Nemhart have been really good. Um, and, and again, I, I think it does help that, you know, Neesmith is still taking them on some of those assignments where he's giving up size and weight. You know, he just had LeBron the other night, but I thought he did a really good job on LeBron. Um, and, you know, but it's just he doesn't. He doesn't have to guard a Giannis necessarily, like what he's giving up five, six inches as opposed to two or three, you know, and, you know, you can put a Siakam on a guy like that that's bigger and longer, at, you know, at that level, uh, you know, that helps. I, I think Nemhard's been really good. I mean, to be honest, I think Nemhard has done a better job defensively uh, in the last three weeks, the last couple months that, that Bruce Brown did. Uh, you know, for the Pacers. Yeah, I, I think Nemhard's been a more effective defender. I don't necessarily have numbers to back that up, um, but I, I think Nemhard's been really tough on the guys he's been guarding, you know, more ones and twos. You know, there, there were times last year where he would take on a three or a four because he's a physical defender, but I mean, he's really kind of honed in his assignments. Um, I think he's done a good job blowing up point guards. I mean, you know, D'Angelo Russell did nothing uh, against him at all. I mean, he really, you know, broke him up entirely. So I think, you know, again, their two ace defenders done really good. I think Tyrus Halliburton has actually done some things. Um, you know, he, he hasn't been as much of a liability guarding people man to man. Obviously you're not putting him in tough assignments. You know, you're trying to keep him out of actions if you can, um, and hide him as much as you can. But in terms of the way that they've hidden him, he's done good. And, uh, he's, you know, used his strengths well, you know, for as much as he's not a really, you know, uh, tough, you know, get down on ball defender. He's really good at getting in passing lanes. He's really good at getting his hand on the basketball and good defensive rebounder, you know, and for a guard, pretty good at blocking shots, you know, it's good to get one of those a game. And so uh, I think he's been really effective. And so I, I think he's taken defense more seriously. You know, there, there's still, still some stretches where you'd be like, you know, tied it. Were you even going to try to get in that guy's way? Um, but there are, you know, more, more frequently you're saying, Hey, Ty got in his way. Ty did something. You know, he made a difference defensively. Um, and so, you know, really all five stars you're putting out there are, are doing pretty well. Um, you know, the, the defensive second five, uh, it, it's not at its peak. I, I think they've had, you know, there was a time when Nemhart and Neesmith were on the second unit, and that was a really good, you know, second uh, five defensively. Um, 
with this group, when you're going McConnell, Shepard, uh, you know, Toppin, you know, Jalen Smith or Isaiah Jackson, you know, that that's that's a pretty good four. And a lot of times it's a Stockton or it's a, a you know, uh, you know, or it's a Halliburton. And, but in some cases, it's Jairus Walker, who I think has done a really good job defending lately. I mean, I think you've, you've seen some real strides from him his ability to gamble less, stay down uh, in defensive stances. You know, like a, a lot of guys, I think, have made some individual improvements. They're just collectively playing tougher. I mean, like Rick Carlisle always uses the word presence. And I think every time we ask about, you know, defense, like, you know, he – he can sense that we're looking for an X's and O's answer, and, and he, it's always like, guys, it's presence. It's just playing tough. It's just deciding you're going to defend somebody. Um, and they have more collectively uh, decided they were going to defend somebody. Do you think – I mean, obviously the consistency losing to the bad teams um, has been a issue with this team all year. Uh, last night uh, – we're recording this on uh, Tuesday, Monday night, they just annihilated the Nets – um, is that a sign of maybe this team figuring a few things out, or is that a sign of boy have the Nets checked out of this season? Uh, I feel like it's more than the latter. I mean, it's both, but I think it's more the latter than the former. I mean, I, obviously, I mean they were on a second night of a back to back too, so that's something. You know, I mean, like you, you, you know, like when you get this deep in the season, you see a different team on a second night of a back to back, and certainly seen that with the Pacers. You know, o- over the last month, you know, that like second nights of back to back has been rough. You know, with the Clippers being in a side and the LA, the LA like second night is kind of a weird thing because at least you get to stay in your same hotel, you don't have to go anywhere. You know, like, um, and you know that's definitely nicer. I think like that's probably you know, as rested as you are for the second night of a back-to-back is the one in LA because you're not home having to do things and you're also not, you know, having to get on a plane. Um, but, you know, like that, there's something to be said for that, but maybe, man, Brooklyn looked look terrible. I mean, like they just couldn't stop anything the Pacers wanted to do. I and mean, it was just like, there was just zero resistance with them trying to get the ball in the lane. And Carlisle came out like, man, we're going to have some problems on Wednesday. And I don't know if they will. I mean, maybe Brooklyn will be a, a tougher out at home and, you know, not coming off a back-to-back. You know, it's possible, but like, you know, Brooklyn is hanging by the tiniest mathematical thread that you could be on um, to, you know, in terms of having a postseason chance. Like, I mean, like they have to win out. Atlanta has to lose out and they get the tiebreaker in that case. That's the only reason this isn't over. You know, they're down six and a half with six to play and Atlanta happens to be playing seven. So Atlanta has to lose all seven. They have to win all six. And, you know, in that case, they get the tiebreaker and they get the 10 seed. You know, that's not going to motivate you very much just to get the last play in thing. I think Brooklyn's just, you know, it's probably checked out. And, and like, obviously, you know, in, uh, you know, next week they'll play Toronto and you're not going to see the same Toronto team that's given the problems. You know, Toronto's out and they've lost 13 straight. And so I presume the level of resistance is just not going to be very high. Um, so they're in a position where they just have to show up and play for on a couple of those. You know, I, I think Wednesday night being one of them and Toronto being the other, where it's just don't go mess around, you know, like just give them no hope early, you know, and you'll probably be fine. You can mess around in the third quarter and the fourth quarter and you'll already have a 25 point lead and they won't come back on you, but you better, you know, play hard for two quarters, you know, go up by 25 and then you can cruise. Uh, yeah, it's a, the Pacers have to like the fact that the Raptors don't seem to be trying uh, too hard at this point, given the, they're a yeah. long team that have given the, the Pacers issues. And uh, Big time. Uh, you'd like to be able to, to notch that as a win. Um, all right, let's move on to Tyrese Halliburton. He's only got $40, $50 million riding on whether he's uh, going to be all NBA or not. Um, I just am scratching down some names here. Um uh, I I assume the top five for almost everyone is Doncic, uh, Antetokounmpo, uh, Shea Gilders Alexander, Jason Tatum, Jokic. Uh, maybe you can yeah. put someone on instead of Tatum, but we're not too worried about what your top five is, as opposed to clearly yes. all five of those guys are ahead of Tyrese Halliburton. Sure. Um, yes. No doubt about it. I got it. I mean, Durant's probably. I mean, Durant's got to be ahead of him. Um, I mean. Booker is only at 61 games. You got to get to 65. I don't know that you can. I mean, I, I'm not too fired up about putting two sons on the team, um, sure. given the way uh, they're playing. But obviously, you got to consider him. Uh, Brunson, uh, Jalen Brunson's been been crazy. Seth Curry's going to make it. Anthony Edwards um, is going to yeah. make it. Um, who am I missing? That uh, you know, again, LeBron James or Anthony Davis. One of them has to is making it. So one, two, three, four. I mean, I, that's at least four, depending on where you are at on Brunson and the second son. Um, 
uh, Kawhi Leonard is pro- has got to be on there, I would think. I mean, Paul mm-hmm. George has a case. Yes. Uh, uh, De'Aaron Fox. I think I think Halliburton's ahead of Fox. Uh, Probably. Uh, but Jalen uh, 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 Bonus, Brown, maybe. Uh, Gobert and then Halliburton. I mean, how many of those guys – is he one of the 15 best players in the NBA based on the names I'm reading you now? It's really close. I mean, it, it's really close because certainly there is there are have been times this season where he's unequivocally uh, one of the you know best fifteen yeah. players in the league, and there have been times where he unequivocally isn't. Um, and so <clears throat> that's I think tough to square is to say, you know, how how are you you know uh, evaluating all of that and saying okay, you know, like what th- there there's there's a, a big significant stretch and a big significant time in you know February and March and, and March in particular uh, where he's really struggling to put the basketball in, and when you go that long just hanging in there, you know, like. Uh, you know, can you be an all NBA player? And, you know, if you're going to average 20 a game, you know, like, is that going to be enough? But again, he's going to lead the NBA in assists, you know, presumably. And, you know, so you have to consider the playmaking caliber. You have to consider that that when he's at his best, he's a, he's a, you know, phenomenal scorer. You know, there's also team aspects for this. I mean, on some level, I guess this is narrative, you know, if you want to call it that. Um, But, you know, he gets, he's getting the Pacers back in the playoffs. I mean, he's, he's created a force. Um, you know, he's the trigger man for the best offense in the NBA uh, or, or for the most explosive offense in the NBA. I think they're second in offensive rating still. Uh, and I think they're probably, you know, one or two in field goal percentage. You know, he's the guy that's moving all of that. And so he's made them uh, really something special. I mean, so he, there are a lot of arguments for, but it's going to be tight. I mean, it's going to be tight, I think, for those for those last five spots. I mean, I think um, – I think I think the five guys you mentioned, you know, uh, you know, Joker, Doncic, Shy, or Shea, uh, Tatum, and uh, who did I forget? Um, Tatum, Giannis, Joker, Giannis. Yeah, yep. I mean, those. I, I, I think those five guys are pretty are, are pretty safe. And there was a time during this year where I had um, I was doing a straw poll for ESPN, and I think uh, I had a. Durant in there and there was a time where you could put him in there but I think he's been good enough to at least be uh you know second team and I think you know LeBron has probably still been good enough uh to be second team and certainly he's gonna you know play a really good basketball down the stretch I think Anthony Edwards very clearly has been uh you know Curry's certainly gonna make it you know you'd have to think and then again like you're you're splitting Harrison the third team and I think Brunson gets in um you know I think in terms of guys if you look at and say okay well you know like Halliburton was an Eastern Conference all-star starter, you know, so if you're looking at that as the starters were the top 10 guys, you know, who are five guys that would have jumped him, you know, if you're going to look at it that way, um, then I do think, you know, Brunson is one of those names. You know, I think, I think Brunson is definitely one of those guys. Uh, and I, don't, I don't think Lillard's quite there in terms of a guy that could beat him out, but I, mean, I don't know if that's a totally out of the question. Um, I didn't put him on the list. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of, of, of people. I mean, there, there are definitely people we're forgetting. Um, you know, I, don't I think mean, Zion, Zion uh, Williamson has been playing great lately. Yeah, I don't know if he's uh, quite there. Um, you know, um, I feel like I got, I got to call up stats to look at this. But, yeah, no, it it, it is going to be tough. I mean, again, it is going to be tough. I mean, like, it's helpful that he is finishing. I mean, he can help himself by finishing strong. I mean, I think that's another thing to note um, is that if he, um, you know, if, if he's able to, uh, you know, have a good close, get them up to fourth or, you know, if, if he moves them up to fourth or fifth, that certainly goes a long way. Um, you know, there are a lot of things he could do, I think, to help himself, uh, to put himself in a good position, you know, down down the stretch to, you know, make a final case. But I mean, like there's, you know, there's a really good players. I mean, he's fortunate that Donovan Mitchell, I don't think is, is he's not going to qualify. You know, I think he's a guy that, that would be in that discussion, if not for that, um, you know, but yeah, I think, it's going to be tight, you know, because I, I think you almost have to put Brunson ahead of him. You know, Booker, I, I think, has a really good case. Booker's averaging, you know, 27.4 a game. I mean, he's been really terrific. Iron Fox has been really, really terrific. Uh, it looks like you know, Trey Young's not going to get there on games. I mean, like, he'd be part of that discussion if he wasn't. Um, yeah, no, it's it's going to be tight. It's definitely going to come down to it for him, I think. Tyrese Maxey, you know, is – I, pro, I mean, I, I I still take Halliburton, but you know, Maxi is at least a guy that's going to be talked about. You know, like Davis has been phenomenal defensively, in particular. You know, I like I feel like you've got to put him on there, so it's it's not going to be easy to make a decision here at all. Yeah, we got the top five. I think Durant, Curry, Edwards, Leonard, uh, Brown, Davis. That's six more. 
Brown. I didn't say Jalen Brown. Yeah. Yeah. Like I think now it seems like he's gonna make it. I mean, again, I understand that um if you want to make a case uh for Halliburton over Brown, you can do it. But sure. uh, I mean Brown's averaging twenty three a game. He's been incredible down the stretch. He's a great all around player. Um so if, if you count those six, then we're down to Brunson, Booker, who may not again, sixty one games, he's really close. Uh, Paul George, De'Aaron Fox, uh, LeBron James, Rudy Gobert, Halliburton. So, I mean, Br- I can Brunson. I think's got to go ahead of him. Um, I think LeBron's got to go ahead of him. I don't. I'm not fired up about putting two Lakers on the team, but boy, it's hard to, to sure. skip uh, LeBron or Davis. Um, so then I got two spots left for uh, maybe Booker, maybe George, maybe Fox, maybe Gobert, maybe Halliburton. And I think Halliburton's one of those two guys, but boy, that's that's a lot. I don't, you know, I guess if I had $200 million in my pocket and I was only counting on this for only for an extra $50 million, I guess I'd be okay with that. But boy, that would be, I, I'd be concerned. So, uh, yeah, um, no, it's tight. It's tight for sure. And something like, and you know why, you know, like obviously, uh, you know why he pushed it just to, just to at least be qualified, you know, like it's right. It's tight. And, you know. I, mean, I mean, I guess the other thing you, you could factor in is if he hadn't – coming back early, I think clearly – I should also note he's at 63 games. He needs two more. I guess the the uh, the, 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 the interim – The season tournament final counts. The season They're not tournament gonna... doesn't, does, uh, has, may count. I think people have reported that it counts, that the NBA has never actually set its count in one of those wonderful – uh, yeah. media league things, but right, um, I, they haven't been out there. I think, I think they're basically looking at it as we're not going to say this until we need to, you yes. know, but Which I, is, just say it, it's okay. It's, just say it, <laughs> you know. I mean, like Rick Carlisle obviously came out and said, like, Look, uh, I feel like this guy, you know, took this team to the, you know, to the finals, he should get credit for that game. Um, but you know. I think they're going to wait to say, like, if he gets to 64, they're going to declare and say, okay, this guy's eligible or whatever. And you'll know if you're voting. We should know we're not voting, by the way. We don't have a vote um, for a reason. So, oh, yeah, yeah. But well, we, we could, we can hit on that. It's a little, should we disclose this baseball stuff, but, but we did, uh, Dustin did turn down an opportunity to vote on it. As part of the media, you're not supposed to be making news, in which case, voting on all NBA is definitely making news this year. Um, you, you know, different media companies handle this differently. I'm certainly not going to criticize anyone who does have people. Um, but we both agreed that being this directly connected to perhaps giving a player $50 million or not giving a player $50 million who you are covering every day was not a position we wanted to be in. Um, right. So we basically this year declined, Dustin declined the opportunity to vote on the NBA awards. Yeah, yeah. we might do it later. But like, I mean, I, I was – Hoping that there would be other things we could vote on other than this, uh, but yeah, some, I mean, that's, some leagues you different people vote on different things. Some leagues, yeah. a certain group of people vote on everything. The NBA, in this case, you had to vote on everything. Uh, everything votes nothing. on everything. So, so. Yeah, it's just like this was too, uh, just for far-reaching things in terms of like, all right, like one way or the other, you know, like if he wins or loses by one vote, you know, it's like that's not a thing you know, that you want to be in a position of, it's like either a, you end up too close or B you end up, you know, like totally shut off. So it's like, okay, like in any cases, this is not, this is an ethical quandary that we decided to stay away from. And, and we should add, I, I'd be shocked if Halliburton cared or noticed I may mean, probably would notice, but maybe he would care. I just, but probably, I, I feel like if it was one vote, he'd, he'd care. Like he might, and if it, yeah, he also if the guy who's covering him who didn't do it, maybe he does care. Yeah, so. Halliburton has a Halliburton has a petty vein, <laughs> and I, I I would imagine that vein gets bigger when it involves fifty million dollars. So and, yeah. and again, like yeah, I realize he's got two million dollars in his pocket, but I don't care. Fifty million dollars is fifty million dollars. When I turn down ten dollars from anyone, I will criticize somebody else for not. For, yeah. You know, I will criticize an athlete for. Giving a not giving a hometown dis- discount or any of that nonsense, but until I turn down ten dollars, I'm not right. criticizing anyone for maximizing how much money they can make. No, um, not really. and like I said, I, I mean, maybe he deserves a little bit of a break for having to come back early to make sure he got the games. It sure seemed like it's who knows, but it seemed like coming back early was part of that slump that he now seems to be uh, out of, um, which is good. Mm-hmm. I, w- I would think that would help him too in the voting that you know. Can you uh, do you take the season as a full scope? 
and say right. if this little bit of weirdness wasn't there, we he he definitely you know be on this team. So we'll make him third team. But uh, another interesting thing to watch. Um, Anything else you want to hit on Pacers wise before we uh, we we shut down the? Uh, I think that's it. I feel like you do got to give uh, credit for Rick Carlisle for passing Red Auerbach. Oh, absolutely, know, took, took him a lot more games certainly than Red Auerbach coached. Um, <laughs> but because you know Red Auerbach's winning percentage is absurd, I think he's top three uh, all time in that particular category. And certainly when you win uh, eight titles in a row to close your career, uh, that's kind of impossible. I think kind of impossible. Very to hit, but I mean, it was sort of cool to see him talk through that. Uh, you know, Rick Carlisle talked through that the other, the, the, you know, last night. Um, just thinking about how important Rick Auerbach was in his career, even though, you know, Rick didn't coach him, certainly Auerbach, or Auerbach didn't coach him. He was out of, uh, you know, finished after the 66 season and handed it over to Bill Russell and was just kind of behind, the, not behind the scenes, but certainly in uh, the GM president, you know, front office guy, executive. Yeah, he drafted role. Carlisle. I mean, that, yeah, that's, he drafted Rick Carlisle and, and Rick noted. Connection. Yeah, Rick Carlisle gave him, uh, you know, Auerbach gave him advice, you know, basically between, you know, his assistant job with the Pacers and then when he got his first full-time job with the Pistons, you know, he was out on TV for a minute and, you know, was trying to figure out how he could get in and do it, you know, be a head coach. And uh, he sat down with Auerbach and he said, I, will, I won't tell you what he told me, but I have to tell you that it was spot on. Um, so that was kind of cool to see him talk through. And it was, it was weird to kind of juxtapose that. He caught me smiling because I knew – um, you know, he was talking about how you have to hold everybody to higher standards and talking about this game that they just barely won. And I'm thinking, I'm now going to ask you about Red Hour back. And, you know, like you're going to have to transition from being kind of dour about this 22 point loss to talk about, you know, passing an all time great. Let's see how you do that, Rick. Um, but he, uh, you know, like it, he was, it was, uh, it was very gracious in the way he talked about it. I thought in, in terms of, you know, obviously knowing that having more wins than Red Auerbach doesn't mean you're better than Red Auerbach, um, but just gives you a moment to kind of appreciate, you know, what he did, but also what Carlos done. I mean, he's, uh, you know, like there's only one other guy between him and the thousand win club, you know, I mean, it's, so there's 10 guys that won a thousand, there's Bill Fitch and there's Rick Carlisle and, and, you know, Carlisle's certainly going to pass Fitch presumably next year. Um, and, you know, he might be able to do it by the end of this season, but he'll certainly do it next season. Uh, and he's got a real crack, certainly at getting a thousand wins. If he's able to stay, stay around for, you know, even two or three more years uh, with this team, puts him on perfect pace to do so. If he can win, if they can win 45, 50 next year, uh, you know, he'll, he'll, you know, be pretty close to that. Um, so, you know, it's obviously t says a lot about what the guys are calling. Yeah, I grew up in Massachusetts, uh, so very familiar with Red Auerbach and just, um, I mean, obviously the incredible winning he did, uh, the moves he made, adding uh, Bill Russell, um, trading uh, for Robert Parrish and Kevin McHale. Um, you know, he had a huge impact on, uh, you know, not being afraid to, to make Bill Russell the first uh, black coach, um, playing more blacks than other teams did. He had a, a huge role in terms of uh, um, integrating the game, yeah, mm -hmm. advancing the NBA in a way that needed to be done. Um, and yeah, I mean, he was super totally different time. You probably don't think there's anyone you can, uh, I don't know, the Wizards is still around, but it's really hard to trick teams uh, the way Auerbach used to, but you cannot, all you can do is judge somebody on what they did and his his run was incredible. And for Rick uh, Carlisle to pass him is obviously an incredible feat that uh, should be appreciated. So Yeah, no, absolutely. So, well, we appreciate you watching and listening to the uh, From Way Downtown Pacers podcast. Uh, go to IndyStar.com as we finish out the season here and look forward to the playoffs. Thank you for uh, thank you again.